Greetings and welcome to tail module 3 unit 3. This unit is somewhat peculiar or different from what we otherwise will be getting involved in this uh, module. This is related to how brains learn and it is going to be in two parts. The first part uh, presents a little bit of anatomy of the brain and the second part we will identify some aspects of the brain, how they influence our teaching and learning. And uh, here before move, we move on, we understood in the last unit what, inst what an instructional situation is and the values and conditions of this instructional in situation can greatly influence instructional learning. We have very looked at in detail and practically every college has its own peculiar uh, instructional situation and to that extent any teacher who comes to that college will have to adjust his instruction uh, within that situation or that context. Now, what we will be looking at in this um, unit, we will spend a little time in understanding why a teacher should know some, something about how brains learn and uh, understand very little the structure of the brain. After all, what is a teacher doing every day? Every day he is trying to change the brain of his students because that is where the learning takes place. That means, I am continuously changing the brain of my students. To that extent, teaching is the art of changing the brain, that is how one can interpret. So, obviously, teacher has very, very close relationship with the functioning of the brain. And the more they know about how it learns, because it is a brain that learns, the more they know about how it learns, the more successful they can perform their job of changing the brain. And knowledge of biology of learning, we can say biology of learning because every time you are learning something biologically happening in the brain and how much an individual's environment can affect the growth and development of the brain. Uh, an understanding of that can help all educators. The more you are familiar with this, the more you the teacher can perform his job better. And in the last uh, several decades, there is lot more that has been understood because thousands and thousands of researchers are working on various facets of the brain. And of course, our understanding of the brain at biological level possibly started in the middle uh, 19th century. Though we have records of um, uh, you even doing brain surgery in uh, thousands of years ago, but we do not know the details of all that. Even if there is some knowledge, it is not readily accessible to us. And some findings from the brain research. For example, the human brain continuously reorganizes itself on the basis of input. This process is called neuroplasticity and continues throughout one's life. This is something you should remember because there are what we call computer model of uh, the brain. That means, people recognize it a brain as a computer and then the whatever input sensory input that we get the computer processes it and gives you the output which may be translated into some action. But here the computer itself is continuously reorganizing itself on the basis of input. As new inputs come to us new experiences happen to us the, the brain continuously reorganizes itself. In spite of its great complexity, brain cannot multitask. 
it cannot perform two cognitive activities at the same time. Though one may switch from one cognitive task to the other which many youngsters feel that they can multitask, but the brain is not designed to do two tasks at the same time. What is actually happening is we are switching between two tasks continuously that is you stop the work ad address the other one stop that and address the previous one which actually in the end turns out to be very inefficient. So, one should not perform multiple tasks at the same time. Emotions affect learning, memory and recall. Any emotion will affect learning and memory and recall. So, to that extent we cannot consider even a highly technical subject that one should not have any emotional aspect of it Every, everything should be neutral and that is something that, that does not happen with the brain and the teacher and the students have to recognize emotions play a very dominant role in the learning. And movement and exercise that is if a person continuously exercises every day, it improves the mood, increases the brain mass and enhance cognitive processing. The if you are if you are involved in continuous exercises, you are exercising regularly, then your uh, it improves your mood and also can enhance your cognitive processing. Teaching and learning can be more difficult at certain times of the day. So there are circadian cycles in a day. There are certain periods in which you can do better compared. Uh, compared to your work at some other time. These are some findings and some more sleep deprivation and stress can affect learning and memory. So, if you there is sleep deprivation obviously you are not going to learn that very much. And intelligence and creativity are two separate abilities that should be recognized an intelligent person, highly intelligent person need not be creative, highly creative person need not be that great, greatly intelligent, but both can be modified by the environment and schooling. That means, they are not exclusive either, they are two separate abilities, they are not exclusive, one can groom himself or herself both in the intelligence direction as well as creative direction. Social and cultural climate affect teaching and learning that the brain has obviously a great deal to do with that. And more importantly arts can help develop the brain. Okay. We will not be exploring all this these are presented to you as a few uh, bits uh, to represent some of the findings from the brain research to convince you that an understanding of the brain or its functions or its structure can help the teacher better. The subject is called educational neuroscience also known as mind brain and education if you want it that way or I would change the sequence brain mind and education. The, this field of inquiry looks at how we are learning about the human brain can affect the curricular instructional and assessment decisions that teachers make every day. For example, we will see in the following unit a little bit of understanding of the brain uh, can help the teachers design the curriculum better. We will see, we will look at a few of these features. But the uh, knowledge of this uh, neuroscience, educational neuroscience is certainly not going to lead to making teaching and learning process a perfect one because we are far from fully understanding how things happen in the brain. At least not in the near future we will be, we'll be making teaching and learning process a perfect one, but we can make a with whatever knowledge we have we can make it a better one. Now, 
start with some basic facts about the brain. Human brain is a wet fragile mass that weighs about 1.5 kg or a little less. It represents only 2 percent of the body weight, but it consumes nearly 20 percent of our calories. So, as you can see uh, it consumes uh, a it requires lot of energy for this 2 percent of the body weight to function. Now, the brain can be described in several ways according one classification is according to three stages of evolution. We have reptilian brain, the what we call brain stem, uh, paleo mammalian brain that is limbic area we call it limbic area and mammalian that is frontal lobes. So, we will look at them in the reverse order. We call this a cerebrum as you can see uh, this uh, orange colored one or pink colored one is the cerebrum and uh, this is how it will look and this is a side view and there is a what we call a sulcus there is a middle at the middle of the brain you have a, a furrow which makes it look like two different hemispheres and um, the, the top view really represents as two similar looking uh, hemispheres. And now here the, these are let us put it this way we will look at there are lobes in this cerebrum frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe and occipital lobe and uh, these are we will uh, we will return to this this is called cerebellum or small brain as it is called and here you have motor cortex and uh, somatosensory cortex we will explain that. And as you can see this is the top portion of the th this part and this is the what do you call limbic area or middle brain and this is this part is is the brain stem ok. Now, so here what happens cerebrum represents nearly 80 percent of the brain by weight and I have already mentioned one shallow fissure runs from front to back and divides the cerebrum into two cerebral hemispheres. The two hemispheres uh, they are not identical in their functions, but there are several activities which are similar. The two hemispheres communicate with each other and coordinate activities using a bridge called corpus callosum. It is a kind of a bridge it consists of more than 200 million nerve, nerve fibers so that the two hemispheres can act together. And the hemispheres are covered by cortex, cortex is nothing English translation for the word cortex is nothing but the bark of a bark of a tree. So, it is like a bark cortex is nothing but the top layer of that it is about 1 inch 1 tenth of an inch thick that is what the, the cortex is. And the cortex is rich in cells arranged in six layers and is often referred to as the brain's grey matter. Uh, interestingly, nerves from the left side of the body cross over to the right hemisphere, and those from the right side of the body cross over to the le left hemisphere. That is how it is wired. It is still not completely known why it has why it has evolved like that and what is the purpose of that and cerebrum is responsible for thinking, perceiving, producing and understanding language. All the thinking process take place in the cerebrum. And now the cerebral cortex that is the cover the top layer of that it consists of four lobes we call it frontal lobe, temporal lobe, occipital lobe and parietal lobe. 
there are four lobes and what are they? Frontal lobe the part lie that lying behind the forehead is called prefrontal uh, cortex and also it is known as the executive control center and it deals with planning and thinking. That is the most important differentiating aspect of humans compared to the other uh, mammals. It uh, monitors higher order thinking, directs uh, problem solving and regulates the excess of emotional system because emotional system can be very strong. So, it has to regulate that. It also contains our so called self will area which may be called as our personality. It is also the area where focus occurs because most of the working memory is located here. We will look at working memory in the later unit because memory consists of working memory and long term memory. The interesting thing about this is the if you look at the frontal lobe and also the midbrain or the emotional part of it if you talk about that there is a 10 to 12 year gap between the developmental frontal lobe and that of the, the limbic area or where the emotions are situated. If you look at this uh, the limbic area where the emotions are we will explain presently it uh, matures by the age of 12 that is fairly strong, but then the frontal lobes take a longer time for them to evolve. So, almost until the age of 24 these evolve and the gap between the two here that means, there is a gap here especially at the age of 12 the gap is very large and this is where emotion dominates the reason because the reason it gets developed here it takes a longer time. So, what happens during this period the adolescent period where emotion can dominate the reason. Now, let us look at the other three lobes. Temporal lobes are located behind the ears and deal with sound, music, face and object recognition and some parts of the long term memory. The left temporal lobe houses the speech centers. Occipital lobes are located at the back of the uh, brain or cart, uh, cerebrum and are used almost exclusive uh, exclusively for visual processing. That is where all the visual processing takes place and parietal lobes located at the top deal mainly with the spatial orientation, calculation and certain types of recognition. These are the three lobes. In addition to this you have two motor cortex and somatosensory cortex. Uh, Let us go back a little bit to look at the where they are located here. Now, this is where parietal lobe which we mentioned and these are the frontal lobes and there are two bands these two bands one is called motor cortex and the other is called somatosensory cortex as you can see. The band from ear to ear near the frontal lobe is the motor cortex this strip controls the body movements and works with cerebellum which is the small brain which we have indicated to coordinate learning of motor skills. Any kind of any kind of skill that you develop the cerebellum and the motor cortex will have to work very closely together and that is where the mastery has to take place. And somatosensory cortex is located behind motor cortex and close to the parietal lobe and process process touch signals received from various parts of the body. So, that is the some organization of the uh, of the cerebrum. Now, cerebellum if you look at 
it is a it is below and at the back side of that and it touches the brain stem and of course, connection is through the pons indicates it is actually a kind of a traffic uh, thing sig signals there are several nerves and then they are rooted to various parts of the brain. We will come back come to that and what does cerebellum do? It is a literal translation is little brain is two hemisphere structure located just below the rear part of the cerebrum right behind the brain stem. It coordinates movement and is important to performance and timing of complex motor tasks. Okay. It may also store the memory of automated movement like there are many movements in a day that we perform after you learn a bicycle or after you learn to drive a car most of the movements become automatic and it is cerebellum that is responsible for making or store the memory of automated movement. So, even without uh, any part of the what do you call uh, cortex coming in the, it has been stored in this particular part of the cerebellum. Actually such uh, automation of the such automation the performance can be improved. It is also known to be involved in mental rehearsal of motor tasks that is when you see or otherwise you are mentally rehearsing the of the motor once again this is very valuable in terms of uh, learning a uh, motor movements. It is also believed it also acts as a support structure in cognitive processing by fine tuning our thoughts, emotions, senses and memories. It greatly enlarges the scope of cognitive activities. As you can see practically every part of the brain is somehow involved in many of the activities that we do. Now, come the we come to the middle brain or what we call limbic system. We will first identify it is mainly consists of this thalamus ok. This is the uh, that uh, light bluish green one and then uh, as you can see corpus callosum is uh, what is indicated this grey or bluish grey area is the bundle of nerves that connects from the two parts two hemispheres. And here we, we uh, when we look at the limbic system we are looking at thalamus hypo what do you call hypothalamus and uh, this is the this is the one hypothalamus and amygdala and hippocampus. These are the four major parts that of course, many of them we have se separate names their roles are different we are not going to go through all of that. Now, let us look at the so, limbic system is nestled between brain stem and cerebrum uh, and the structures of this limbic system are duplicated in each hemisphere. It generates emotions and processes emotional memories and manages the interplay between emotion and reason. See most of the signals we will have to from the body or from every other point it will have to go through this limbic system and because of that the the emotions can greatly influence the uh, your cognitive process as well. Okay, the four major parts of the limbic system are thalamus, hypothalamus, hippocampus and amygdala. Let us look at thalamus and hypothalamus all sensory information except smell goes to the thalamus from where it is directed to other parts of the brain for additional processing. First information sensory information comes to thalamus and it is, it is then directed to other parts of the brain. The cerebrum and cerebellum also send signals to thalamus involving it in many cognitive activities including memory. As we said hypothalamus is located just below thalamus 
and hypothalamus monitors the internal systems to maintain the normal state of the body. That means, there are several body functions which are, are not consciously controlled like maintaining the body temperature, functioning of heartbeat whatever you call it heartbeats and all that are are monitored and controlled by hypothalamus. And what you call homeostasis it maintains whatever specified va values they are supposed to be maintained. Okay. But how does it control? It controls mainly by releasing of a variety of hormones if by the amount of hormones it releases it moderates the body functions including sleep body temperature, food intake and liquid intake. That is how by releasing it, it control is not is though possibly there is nervous system is also involved, but it may its main control is through is chemical by releasing hormones. And hippocampus, hippocampus literal translation is sea horse because somebody felt when they looked at it it looked like a seahorse that is why it is named as hippocampus located at the base of limbic area. It converts information from working memory to the long term storage region which may take days to months. Okay. It does not immediately whatever working memory you have that means temporarily it is stored it does not automatically go to the long term storage region. unless that is where our teaching comes into picture or the students practices will come into picture to transfer information from working memory to the long term storage region. It constantly checks information related to working memory and compares it with the stored experiences. It has the capability of neurogenesis which has significant impact on learning and memory. Okay. This neurogenesis can be strengthened by diet and exercise and weakened by prolonged sleep loss. So, the hippocampus as you can see plays also an important role in, in terms of teaching and learning. Now, come the amygdala again little translation is uh, the almond literal translation amygdala is, is because it the amygdala looks like a small an almond. Amygdala is attached to the end of hippocampus. It plays an important role in emotions especially fear and it regulates individuals interactions with the environment and can affect survival such as whether to attack, escape, mate or eat. Its role becomes dominant because the time it takes to react to the external signals or signals from environment is very fast compared to the signals getting processed by the what you call logical part of the brain by the various lobes. And uh, this in an evolutionary uh, rather through evolution this has been possibly you can say it is designed or it evolved to protect the people in the sense that if there is a danger in the environment either you have to attack or escape that is the major reason. So, the reactions can be fairly strong it is believed that amygdala encodes an emotional message if one is present whenever a memory is tagged for long term memory. So, you long term memory is gen, if it is tagged with an emotional message then it can be recalled lot more easily uh, if the otherwise if it is not tagged we can still recall, but it may not be that effective. It is possible that emotional component of a memory is stored in the amygdala while other cognitive components are stored elsewhere. This is one thing we will see in the next unit the, the same message or a same picture or whatever an event that you have experienced the entire thing is not 
data stored in one place in the brain. Different bits of that are stored in different parts of the brain. Somehow they are connected to each other and if any one is uh, like one cue comes then the entire event somehow mentally gets recreated. But different parts of the event are stored in different parts of the brain. The two structures in the brain mainly responsible for long term uh, remembering are located in the emotional area of the brain that is the amygdala and the hippocampus. They are the ones uh, are uh, responsible for long term memory as well. Now come the brain stem, we are not going to look into all the details, uh, the main part is really this and uh, this is the spinal cord and uh, the cerebellum is located here and is extended further. This is the edge of cerebrum and that is high, that is the thalamus part and this is our, uh, our brain stem. What does it do? The brain stem is also referred to as reptilian brain is the oldest and deepest part of the brain. 11 of the 12 body nerves that go to the brain end in brain stem itself. Vital body functions such as heartbeat, respiration, body temperature and digestion are monitored and controlled right in the brain stem itself. It also houses the reticular activating system responsible for brain's alertness because reactions have to be very fast if there is any danger in the environment. Pons, you we have seen what that is uh, we um, here. This is the pons and it is a kind of uh, it includes neural pathways and tracts that conduct signals from the cortex down to the cerebellum and medulla and tracts that carry the sensory signals up into the thalamus. So, it is a kind of uh, bundled or it is like kind of a junction from there sig uh, the nerves from the from cerebrum come to medulla and, and cerebellum and vice versa. Now, we come to the most critical part of the brain uh, rather what do you call where all the work gets done. Human brain has 1 trillion cells of 2 types imagine 1 trillion cells. They are called nerve cells and glial cells. Nerve cells are called neurons and represent about they are about 100 billion neurons that is the core of the brain really and most of the cells are glial cells that is 900 billion cells they hold the neurons together and act as filters to keep and uh, harmful substances out of the neurons and provide the required nutrition to the neurons as well. Neurons are functioning core of the brain. Uh, the neurons come in different sizes because some neurons can travel from all the way down the spinal cord to the leg. So, they can be very long and some can be short and you have a whole range of uh, uh, new neuron uh, in terms of shapes and sizes and functions and so on. But the body of the neuron is extremely small in size in, compar in comparison to its total size. Another interesting aspect of it is neurons have tens of thousands of branches emerging from its core they are called dendrites which can be more than 10,000 per neuron. Okay. They can be 10,000 dendrites per neuron and every neuron will have one axon and a layer called myelin sheath surrounding the each axon. Let us look at the diagram. This is the nucleus of that. And whatever be the size of neuron the body is really this and you have a whole bunch of these dendrites they can be up to 10,000. This part is axon 
and then these are axon terminals. Okay. And the this axon has a sheath like this yellow part, it is a myelin sheath, it comes in parts and mainly what happens it is more like an insulator. There is it is it constitutes actually insulation. So, the transmission of information is through electrical signals. When an electrical signal is sent along the axon what it does is it kind of jumps from here to the next junction from here to this and the myelin sheath essentially makes the uh, flow of these impulses faster if the myelin sheath is properly uh, kind of grows. Okay. Now, let us look at a few more uh, features of neurons. Dendrites of neurons receive electrical impulses from other neurons and transmit them along the axon. The myelin sheath insulates the axon from the other cells and increases the speed of impulse transmission. A neuron can transmit between 250 to 2500 impulses per second. Neurons have no direct contact with each other. Even when you have dendrite and axon, they are, they are not physically connected, they are separated by about a few nanometers. And the when the electrical impulse is is uh, transferred from dendrites to axon through not uh, directly but through neurotransmitters, and there are a large number of neurotransmitters available. Learning occurs by changing the synapses so that the influence of one neuron on another also changes. The learning is consists of a growing more dendrites and changing the si what do you call behavior of the synapse that is where the learning is. And here if you look at this, this is the neuron and you have a whole bunch of these dendrites and this is the dendrites of other neurons get connected to the uh, neuron terminal and synapses really form here. This is how the synapse looks like from one is from dendrite the other is from the terminal neuron terminal. As you can see the neurotransmitters are released let us not worry about this, this complex process how they recycle here and this neurotransmitters are released and they when they come in contact with that again the electrical signal kinds of kind of get started and goes down this. This is that is how the synapse and synaptic junction operate. Brain cells consume oxygen and glucose for fuel that is their fuel. They must have plenty of oxygen and glucose available. The more challenging the brain task the more fuel it consumes. As you all know during your writing exam where our brain is functioning very fast you many most of the people would want to drink more water that is where the oxygen comes actually. Water is required to move neuron si neuronal signals through the brain and low concentration of water diminishes the rate and efficiency of the signals and water also plays a role in lungs for the efficient transfer of oxygen into the blood stream. So, water plays multiple roles in and helps brain to function better. And uh, according to this uh, recommended water intake is 250 ml a day per every 10 kg of body weight that is the minimum that you would require. Now to close we will again talk about teachers and brain. The job of the teacher is to change the brain. I mean, instead of using the word teaching and learning say his job is to change the brain. It is good to know something about the structure and functioning of what he is changing and also be familiar with the current state of educational neuroscience. And one book that we will recommend for, uh, for a starter it is a easily readable book by Sosa uh, how the brain learns.
you, there is plenty of material on the internet as an exercise we would uh, you can do explore some aspect of learning and its relationship and dependent dependence on some aspect of the brain. Maybe you can maximum write, write uh, about 500 words and uh, would appreciate if you share the exercise that you have done at this particular uh, email id and next in the next unit we'll continue the not about the anatomy but assuming that we know something about it how different activities kind of are influenced by the brain chemistry or brain structures Thank you very much.